Hello, and welcome to the fourth episode of the Jaguar Maven podcast. Uh, If you're wondering about the void that was in your life last week uh, uh, during the big holiday week, I know that when it comes to Thanksgiving, the one thing that you're looking forward to is the next episode of Jaguar Maven. Uh, Chib and I, you know, we didn't record last week. Uh, Other things came up, specifically Thanksgiving and other big Jaguar news. Uh, We'll touch on it later, but thanks to... uh, Tel- Telvin Smith, I was uh, the night that we were supposed to record, I was running around all night. You know, th- those kind of <laughs> things, breaking news, uh, just kind of, you know, happens in this business. But we are back this week. And, uh, Treve, I-, I feel like we picked a pretty good day to record because, I mean, we-, we had planned on recording today, like even before yesterday's game started. And uh, with today's news, I mean, it- cards kind of just fell perfectly. <laughs> I-, I mean, I mean, first of all, I just, I just want to say – it, it's not a good look for the Jaguar Maven culture that we missed a week of recording the podcast, but we're trying to build a culture and we're really, you know, thanking God every day that we had a Thanksgiving to spend with our family and, and we promise that we're going to get better every single week, but you're definitely right. This, this is probably the best day that we could have even asked to record. There's, there's definitely a lot of takes to be had and a lot of opinions oh, yeah. to be spurred out, and I'm I'm ready to get into it. That's for sure. oh yeah, for sure, for sure. It was uh, it, it was just one of those trials, you know. I mean, it bu- builds character and whatnot. But uh, I mean, I, obviously, you know, the big news that we're alluding to uh, earlier today, head coach Doug Marone talked to the media, and he said that on uh, you know this upcoming Sunday, uh, home game against the Los Angeles Chargers, that Gardner Minshew the second will be the team starter. Uh, we, ha- we haven't seen Minshew in a starting role since week nine against the Houston Texans in London. And, Tree, uh, uh, just, you know, to start the show, I want you and I to kind of go through this whole, like, Foles-Minshew uh, situation, debacle, whatever you want to yeah, call it. Whatever, be- yeah. Yeah. Like, okay, so gen- generally what had happened was, you know, Foles uh, signs a massive $88 million contract in March Four years, fifty million guaranteed, has a thirty-eight million plus dead cap number in two thousand twenty. It's the biggest contract the team's ever given out to anybody. You know, I mean, like that—that's that, not an exaggeration. It is a fact that Nick Foles has the largest contract of any Jacksonville Jaguars player in NFL history. You know, yeah. I mean, yeah. And fa- fast forward a few months, and j- just real quick, what, what what were your initial you know thoughts when they signed Foles? Because you know, as we're going to allude to, uh, you know, it's kind of completely gone sideways for him but I mean when they signed him did you think it was like a positive thing you know I think a lot of us really hated it at yeah. first and mm-hmm. I think that once the season kind of got closer and closer you know you and it's gonna happen like no matter what with whatever team you know you're covering or what have you you're gonna try and build some optimism you're gonna say yeah Foles is you know a former Super Bowl MVP you know, he's done it before in the playoffs. He wins in December. Like, let's have some optimism for Nick Foles. But initially when we signed him, I was really, really upset about it. Yeah. I was really I was really all in on the idea of the Jaguars getting a guy like Dwayne Haskins or Kyler Murray. In fact, I have a video over on my YouTube channel that I put out during the summertime talking about how the Jaguars will ruin their franchise if they go after Nick Foles and they don't draft a rookie <laughs> quarterback which is just, you know, crazy foreshadowing looking back at it. Say. But, but I mean, <laughs> like, I, I was there. not a fan. Was yeah. not a fan at first. Yeah, for sure. And and I, I, I was, you know, more along, the, you know, the, the lines with you. I thought it was a short-sighted signing at the time. And I'm not saying this just hindsight. Uh, you can, you know, go look at my Twitter from uh, about early March, uh, late February, when it seemed like the full signing was inevitable. Uh, I've become a lot more diplomatic <laughs> since then, yeah. but uh, I, 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 you know, made it clear at the time that I did not think the signing was a good idea, and I, I think it's played out for a lot of reasons. You know, why? And I mean, the, the offense in Jacksonville is just nothing like the offenses that you know uh, surrounded Foles in the past that he was successful in. You know, I mean, his two best seasons uh, were 2013 and uh, 2017 both with the Philadelphia Eagles and they had they had not only weapons around him but they had good offensive lines and that's basically been the thing that's hurt him the most in Jacksonville is he cannot navigate a poor pocket and 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 that that's a big thing you know we'll talk more about it but that's a big reason why he is no longer uh, the starting quarterback but you know I think we're both uh, in agreement there and then, uh, you know, you fast forward to uh, training camp preseason. He only plays a handful of series because Doug Marone 
uh, went with this new strategy of, you know, not playing his starters in the preseason. It's one that I understood completely because it really seemed like they were shell shocked from the injuries in 2018. But at the same time, I think the early rust with the offense in the year was a result of them not really being able to build chemistry. And uh, I think Leonard Fournette has even really said as much when it came comes to the running game because the running game didn't come alive until like you know week four. But I you know you know move past all that. Nick Foles starts week one against the Kansas City Chiefs and goes down with a clavicle injury after taking a big hit from Chris Jones on a 34 yard touchdown pass to DJ Chark. Treeb, when he went down with an injury, did you anticipate any way that when he came back from his injury, because everybody basically had said that, yeah, he'll be back at some point, that he wouldn't be the starter for the rest of the season? Because, I mean, I'll, I'll say all right. I thought he was going to start every single game that he was healthy. Um, I think that there was, there was something in my head that was telling me that this is the Jacksonville Jaguars. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like you have a guy in there right now in Gardner Minshew that is being rather successful. I mean, 500 as a starter, you know, and he has an opportunity to go above 500 when he's out there on the field for the rest of the season. And like you said, we'll talk about that more later. But, you know, I, I just – I had a feeling that this offense had so much chemistry. And it wasn't like Foles was out for like eight was it was out just for like four to five weeks like he was out like nine yeah, he was out and, eight games yeah half a you season. know like he he was out like a good amount of games half the season like this is and you're and you're a team that's you know at the time was in the thick of things like yeah. you bring him back during two of the most important games of the season to you know make your playoff push I just I didn't think that was a great idea and I was hoping that there was something in the front office that kind of, you know, sparked that in their head that it was like, oh, it's not a good idea to bring Foles back, you know, let's maybe bring him in next year. I mean, I get it. You're paying this guy however much money, but let's, you know, let's just do, yeah. roll with what, what what they got, you know what I mean? So yeah, I, no, I, it's, it's the definition of a sunk cost fallacy, you know. I mean, they're, they're thinking, hey, we already spent this money. We have to go through with this. And as, as we both know, that's just not true. I mean, and you, you would think they would know that considering that they literally paid Blake Bortles $16 million to not be on that roster this year. So it just seemed like yeah. they didn't learn any lesson, really. Well, I mean, and it, it's tough, too, because you got Foles who went out there and looked terrible, you know, and I, and I was comatose in the hospital during the freaking Titans game, but I'm assuming he was terrible during that game, and I know he was Correct. terrible <laughs> – in the Tampa game and you know it's just like I just I don't know it, yeah. it's uh, it sucks from a team standpoint and it sucks from a fan standpoint yeah because you know as a fan you're watching this and you're seeing that you know it's another year of not having a good quarterback play and you have a guy that is electrifying the whole entire team you were there at the game like I mean yeah. what was what was the environment like i mean i've seen it on the tv but what was the environment like when Foles finally got benched and Minshew came into the game yeah for sure no i mean uh obviously you know uh Treves referring to uh yesterday's 28 to 11 loss of tampa bay buccaneers uh as everybody knows by now Foles was benched like Treves said at halftime and uh you know what really led to that was the fact that Foles turned it over three times in his first three possessions and then they went three and out on their last six possessions. And every turnover, in my opinion, I'm not, I, I didn't get the sense that Doug Marone agreed, but every turnover I thought was avoidable and at least mostly his fault because that first interception, he gets hit, but he, he throws it right to the linebacker. That, that hit wasn't, you know, massive enough, big enough of one to warrant him literally tossing it to Devin White's chest. You know what I mean? And then uh, the second turnover that fumbled, Juwan Taylor got beat clean by Shaquille Barrett. But Foles kind of faded back into the sack. You know, he, he, he didn't get that sense for pressure. And it's not like it was coming around his backside. It was coming around. He's a right-handed thrower. Coming around his right side, and he backs into the sack and loses the ball. And then, obviously, the third fumble was uh, – the third turnover was the worst one. Uh, he fumbles uh, when the Jaguars had the ball at the Buccaneers' 11-yard line. He tried to extend the play. Uh, he looked very uncomfortable running around in the pocket and then eventually uh, loses the ball after getting sacked. And like Doug Marone said after the game, 
Uh, that shouldn't happen because he saw the defense alignment coming. So there's really no excuse for that. So, uh, you know, just to kind of paint the scene, when I'm at uh, covering Jaguars home games, I'm up in the press box. It is hard for me to get a real sense for the crowd a lot of times because, you know, we're like insulated, you know, like in the mm-hmm. press box, you know. It's not like I'm yeah. in the stands and stuff, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I got you. But while most games I don't hear a lot of crowd noise because of the situation, there are some times where I have, such as, uh, you know, week two when Minshew – uh no no what was it week three against the titans on thursday night football when Minshew hit dj chark for a touchdown in the corner of the end zone the place erupted and you could hear it in the press box uh you could hear most of the things in the press box sunday that is not a normal thing that means the crowd was rocking and i i can tell you you know just from being there it wasn't like the stadium was filled it really wasn't so the fans that were there they were really vocal and you could hear it uh after the first turnover some boo started uh, after the second turnover, which was returned for a touchdown by Devin White, the boos really rained down. Like, they, they were loud enough for me to really be able to hear and make out. And uh, uh, there were some videos of some Minshew chants going on, but I didn't hear the Minshew chants until uh, the final turnover. And But when, when he did fumble it that second time, and they had to come off the field turning it over three times in three possessions, you could hear, you know, like clear as day, we want Minshew. We want Minshew. And the fact that I could hear that in the insulated press box, despite the stadium not being very full, that's pretty telling how yeah. the fans felt, you know? And then, you, you know, like you had said, uh, you know, the big thing with the booze, uh, you know, full said afterward that, you know, hey, it's it's a tough part of the game. It's tough. And then, I, you know, like, like you and I talked about off air, uh, Minshew himself said that he didn't appreciate fans uh, booing Foles, but hey, you know, it happened. It, it happened. And, you know, you, you asked me about the atmosphere when Minshew went back in. Uh, I got in my seat like 30 seconds before the second half kickoff, like back in my seat because I was doing, you know, whatever else in the press box. Mm-hmm. That place erupted, dude. And it was even less full than it was when they were booing him because a lot of people went home at halftime. And that place went nuts you can ask anybody that was there he electrified that entire stadium the Bucks players said after the game he provided a spark uh, Jaguars players said after the game he gave them energy and provided a spark it, 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 it was just undeniable you could feel it seeing him go out there that there was a new energy to to really the environment and I I, I don't think there's any tangible answer to why that is I think all you can do is point out the fact that you know it's a reality yeah, you know, and it, and it and it's hard because uh, it, it 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 what do you expect? You know, it it's Nick Foles like we talked about, or you've been I've been seeing you you know talk about it on Twitter about how you know did the Jags like just not expect Nick Foles to not be like a mobile passer or like be able to move in the pocket, but like it's it's so night and day with like the excitement. You got Nick Foles out there, and that's. Nick Foles but you get Gardner Minshew out there and this is a guy that is mobile in the pocket makes plays he's exciting he's fun to watch like I just don't understand you know why they wouldn't expect that to happen yeah no and I I I think they were definitely thinking you know okay Foles he's a veteran he's he's improved because he's learned from his experiences in 2017 2018 where he won you know uh what was it, four postseason games, including a Super Bowl, including a Super Bowl MVP. And I, I think that they thought that he'd be able to elevate his play and the play around them. I, they, What the Jaguars got was closer to the St. Louis Rams version of Nick Foles. And I think they thought they were getting the 2017 postseason version of Nick Foles. Uh, it, was, it was kind of a fool's gold endeavor, especially to hedge all of your bets on that. But, you know, I mean, it, it is what it is. It happened. But uh, obviously, you know, as we've talked about, uh, Marone min- uh, announced today that Minshew would be the starter uh, moving forward. I, I wasn't surprised uh, at all, really, that Marone announced Minshew as a starter. Uh, I asked him in the press conference yesterday. He said that he put Minshew in the Bucks game to provide a spark, and we then saw him lead two scoring drives. It would have been three scoring drives if D.D. Westbrook doesn't drop a pass in the end zone that's intercepted. I asked him if he provided the spark he was looking for, and he, he said, yeah, he did, because, you know, we had a chance in the game. And then uh, when Marone announced today that Minshew would be the starter instead of Foles, 
the big thing he talked about was mobility and elusiveness behind the offensive line. And I think that's the biggest reason why Minshew's been better than Foles this year. I mean, I mean, do, do you buy that as the big reason why they're going back to Minshew? Yeah. I mean, like, like I said earlier, like the mobility and the elusiveness brings – excitement and it bring you know it makes you want to invest like this is what the nfl is today like there's not there's not a lot of you know yeah. pure pocket passers today that are tearing up the league by storm you know you got to have guys like lamar jackson and the funny thing is is that gardner Minshew never really was that mobile quarterback that yeah. you know was elusive in the pocket during college you know it's something that he added on to his game so i mean the fact that the jag season is kind of all but over I would say, and, you know, the fans just, you know, they're not going to let you forget about it. They're giving you the beans day in and day out you got going on inside the organization, you know, inner conflict. And it just seems like Gardner Minshew, as of right now, is the best decision for this team moving forward. Yeah, yeah. And that's essentially what, you know, Doug Marone said today. He said, you know, more or less, with how this offense is constructed, with our issues along the offensive line, Gardner Minshew gives us the best chance to win. And I, I don't think anybody can disagree with him. I mean, we've seen what the Nick Foles uh, offense looks like. He just – I mean, you, you saw on that on that last turnover what happens when he tries to extend the play like Minshew does. It looks awkward. It looks lumbering. And he, he it, it just doesn't happen, you know. He's a drop-back pocket passer. But they do not have the pieces around that to really make that work. And that that just like like I had alluded to on Twitter, that just lends a whole nother question. Like, what exactly were they evaluating when they brought Foles in? Because everything they have done since they signed Foles is the opposite of you know what a Nick Foles needs for the offense. So I I, I think they kind of you know dug the graves for themselves to begin with, even before the season started. But they got lucky with Minshew. I mean, and th there's no other way around it. Th th they did not know he was going to play as well as he did. If they did, they would have selected him long before the sixth round. They thought yeah. Foles was going to come in here, be a franchise passer, and elevate the offense, be a significantly better than Blake Bortles, and would start for 16 games. And none of that happened. I mean, I, would you say right now he Nick Foles has been a better quarterback for the Jacksonville Jaguars than Blake Bortles? No. Yeah. I like I I, yeah. I was thinking about that the other day. Like at least Bortles could run. Like you know yeah. Bortles yep. could make plays with his legs. Like, yep. and you know it's so funny because when you look at this offense, it's almost like it was tailored and it was fit for Gardner Minshew. Like you said, like it's like it's lucky that they they did not they had no idea Minshew was going to be you know who he is today. I agree with that 100%. But you look at, like, the talent that's around him, like these speedy yeah. receivers that, you know, run these drag routes across the middle, you know, with Minshew scrambling, finding open receivers. Like, it's almost like unintentionally this team built a team around mm -hmm. Gardner Minshew to make this his yeah. team. And the people inside the organization don't want this to be Minshew's team. Yeah, and I mean, I, I'd even say Fournette fits better with Minshew than he fits with Foles, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean Min Minshew's just better under center, and, uh, you know, just his style of play, it's been way more effective with Fournette than the Foles and Fournette pairing has been. But, um, yeah, I mean, that was a decision Doug Marone uh, made today. It's a decision that he made yesterday, really at halftime. I didn't get the sense that Foles was going to be named a starter because I think once you bench him, at home for the rookie quarterback that you had benched a month ago, four foals to begin with, I don't think there is any turning back from that. So I think as long as Doug Marone is the Jaguars head coach, you know, for however long that may be, you know, maybe four more games, I think Minshew's this guy. And I, I, I'm i not sure if everybody in the organization, like you had said, feels like it's the right decision. And uh, that'll actually, you know, bring us to really our next point. Uh, last week, uh, Executive Vice President of Football Operations, Tom Coughlin, uh, spoke for, publicly for the first time all season. You know, I mean, the team was at four and seven. Uh, Coughlin had yet to speak. Uh, really, Doug Marone and his assistant coaches and the quarterbacks were the only people that were really, you know, coming to the podium each week. Uh, we didn't hear anything from the front office after the Jalen Ramsey trade, after the Foles-Minshew decision. We didn't hear anything from them. 
but we heard from Coughlin last week, and we'll go more into what Coughlin said, but Coughlin made a point when at, when pressed about Foles and Minshew. He said, Nick's only played two games. Gardner played well. He didn't play well in London. Nick was ready, and that was the discussion. That made it seem like to me that, all right, Tom Coughlin, you know, one of the two men who signed Foles to this mega contract, uh, is going down with <laughs> the ship that he bought, you know. And I got the sense yesterday when Doug Marone – benched Foles that it was a Doug Marone decision not to say Doug Marone was going rogue but I do not think it is something that the entire front office and coaching staff were in lockstep on and I, I know there were some reports on Twitter after the game of Marone and Coughlin uh what, what I can really say on that is as I was walking into the locker room I saw Coughlin waiting for Marone in an office with his hands on his hips looking like a parent who just caught their uh, 15 year old son sneaking beakers you know he, he he looked he looked disappointed he looked like a disappointed parent not even like a um I'm mad he just straight up like he, he looked sick to his stomach to be honest bro and I, I I just get the sense from everything yesterday and from everything today such as when Marone said he thinks Foles can be a winning quarterback but he needs help around him I get the sense that Marone is not on the Foles train uh, that he's all in on Minshew and I get the sense that the front office isn't and I mean I think that kind of makes sense because uh, if you just sign the guy to the biggest contract in team history and you're admitting a little over halfway through the season that okay this guy isn't it why should you be keeping your job <laughs> you know yeah yeah and I, and I I think that's that's the big thing and I think that Tom Coughlin you know, there's no way like a guy that's been around the game of football for so long and you see a performance like Foles had and you're down 22 to zero at halftime and you don't think that the decision to bench your quarterback is a necessary one. You have three straight turnovers. Yeah. You look terrible out, out there on the field and it's just – it, it seems exactly like what you said. Like, he wants to go down with this sinking ship because, you know, yeah. if Foles isn't it, then Coughlin isn't it either. Yep. Like, that's, that's uh -huh. you know, probably what Tom Coughlin is thinking. 100%. And, you know, Doug and, – and, and I've been – and I've been – I've been pretty vocal about this. I really, really like Doug, Doug Marone. I think he is a great guy. I think he is a pretty, you know, all right head coach as well. And it, it just sucks that he has to go down with this ship because I think that he has potential to be, like, a really good head coach. But, you know, he's just given a really bad situation. When, he's ha when he has a guy like Minshew that, yeah. you know, can be an exciting story and can really be the next man up, you know, it, it, it's yeah, for sure. hard to watch. I mean, I, I, I would love to know, like, his honest opinion and the coaching staff's honest opinion on, hey, we were 4-4 four and four and right in the thick of things entering the bye week. Uh, we were four and five when we benched Minshew. So, you know, we were below 500, but we were four and five, still had a chance to have a winning season. And since then, they have not won a game. I, I, I would just love to hear their assessments on it because I think as a coaching staff that knows they're likely out of here in four games, I think they place a large, you know, share of the blame uh, on that quarterback decision. Obviously, there are other factors in play, such as the, the, the demise of the once great defense. That's probably, you know, 1A and 1B with the reason they're 4-8 and eight right now. Uh, one, the run defense is awful. Two, they benched their best quarterback halfway through the season. Well, but, and, I mean, and something else I got to add, too, like about the mm -hmm. London game is that Houston, as you've seen in the New England game, you know, just this last week, that is a good freaking football team. And then you're going overseas. And, like, I know, you know, obviously you have some guys that have been playing there before, but that's a hard game to win if you play them in Jacksonville like that's a good freaking football team and you know you're gonna base your whole argument about benching Minshew because he played bad in London against Houston who yeah. is arguably like probably the top three best teams in the AFC you know? yeah no for sure and and I, a lot of people harped on the fact that Minshew has yet to be a team with a winning record uh, Foles look bad against the Indianapolis Colts who right now do not have a winning record they're not a good team. They've lost three out of their last four games with their only win coming against Jacksonville. And he was getting the doors blown off of him by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, who have the second-worst scoring defense in the league and the second-worst pass defense in the league. 
They were four and seven entering the game yesterday. They were not the 85 Bears, you know. He was not going yeah. against some defense that should be able to stop a veteran quarterback. He was playing poorly against a bad defense. And I, I, I think that kind of highlighted all the issues. You know, he looked unaware. He looked slow. The ball didn't have much velocity on them. I mean, I'll give him he – threw, he threw a good deep ball yesterday. I will give him that. He – that uh, throw to D.D. Westbrook down the yeah. left sideline on his first drive, that was a beautiful throw. And then on one of his last drives, he went deep to D.J. Chark down the middle, and Chark couldn't bring it in. That, that was actually a pretty impressive throw. So I'll give him that. He, he threw it deep well yesterday. But everything else he did not do well, and he didn't do it well against a bad defense. And I, I think when you're just looking at things in context, you can talk all you want about Minshew struggling against an elite defense in the Saints or a pretty good defense in the Texans. Well, the other guy isn't doing much better against bad defenses. So, I don't know. You know I, and, go ahead. And Foles is getting the, the doors blown off of him. You know, you, you go up against, like, Carolina, whose defense isn't necessarily a slouch either. Minshew's losing these games – but he's in these games. Like, he's not getting the breaks blown off of him. Like, he's losing one possession games against these teams. And he's a rookie freaking quarterback. Yeah. You know, you want to talk about how Nick Foles is this guy that was a Super Bowl MVP. He's won a Super Bowl. And, you know, we need to give him another chance. And Garner Minshew's just a rookie. And he doesn't beat anybody with, you know, winning records. But he's not getting, like, the brakes blown off of him he's keeping this team competitive yeah you get Foles out there and Foles is making this team struggle the team's not as competitive with Nick Foles out there and you know like I keep mm -hmm. saying I think the decision to play Minshew is a good yeah no for sure I uh, just just real quick and then we'll move on to uh, some other non-Minshew Foles stuff uh guess the point differential in the 10 quarters that Foles started over the last three weeks. Just guess what the Jaguars' point differential was. Obviously, it was negative, but just go ahead and give me your get best of ballpark figure. Negative 26. Negative 26? Yeah. It was negative 67. Oh. The Jaguars are outscored by 67 points in the 10 quarters that Nick Foles has played. Oh, over the last okay. Now I, okay, I, I get what that meant now. Oh, yeah, yeah, 26. yeah. No, yeah, no. 67 26 points. was a low guess. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, I mean, 26 would be a nice, uh, you know, for one of the three games. Yeah, that, but, yeah. But, yeah, no, I mean, just, you know, like I said, we'll move on. But I just want to hit on this point one more time. The Jaguars gave him the largest contract in franchise history based off a small sample size. And afterward, what have they gotten out of it? They have gotten a less than 12 quarters of football and their $88 million man has still yet to take a second half snap at TIAA Bank Field, and it's about to be week 14. I, it's, uh, that, that, to me, is potentially the worst return on investment of any NFL contract ever, you know? And it's going to be even worse when they can't pay Yannick and Gawkway because they already paid Nick Foles all that money. Yeah, and, and yeah, and, you know, just in terms of what they can do with Foles moving forward, because a lot of people ask uh, – if he does retire, uh, that money basically is, you know, erased from the cap. But I wouldn't bet on that happening just because. Oh, I'm that'd Nick be Foles. awesome. Yeah, but if I'm Nick Foles, dude, I'm I'm. What what's that one uh meme? Uh, run me my money. That like coach in the locker room. Yeah, that, yeah. that's what I'm doing, bro. I'm saying run me my what? money. I'm not going anywhere. I got three three more years of y'all paying me. And then on the flip side, if they trade him. They still take like eighteen point two five million dollars in dead cap, so they're paying a lot of money whether or not he's on the roster unless he retires. So they're they're kind of stuck with the burden of this contract. You know, on Twitter they 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 keep talking about how rabid these Jaguar fans are. You know, I I wonder if the Jaguar fans could just bully him into retirement. I mean, at this point. Dude, like, I mean, I mean, J Jaguars Twitter is 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 probably like top tier in terms of bullying. But I mean, and I I, I just want to say for record, we've been pretty tough on Foles on this episode. I think Foles is a high character guy. Yeah. I've, all the conversations I've had with him, he he is a good guy. I just don't think he is the guy for the Jaguars right now. And I'm not sure if he's the guy for the Jaguars really at any point. You know, it just it it doesn't seem like this marriage really you know, was going to work from the start. It hasn't seemed like him and Marone are in lockstep. I know last week uh, Marone was asked about culture, something Foles has harped on a lot. And Marone basically laughed at the question and was like, all right, you got to ask Nick. <laughs> I was like, all right, well, that, that, that gives us his take on culture. So 
yeah. I just think at the end of the day, I think it was a tough decision for Marone because of the emotions involved. But I think strictly from a football decision, football perspective, I think it was one of the easier decisions Marone has made this year. Yeah, I agree. And every and everything we 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 say about players is all football related. It's yeah. Never, yeah. Never for sure. to be harped on. For sure. For sure. All right. Uh, no, mo- moving on, a few uh, things that uh, we we didn't talk about last week since we didn't record that I wanted to make sure that we touched on. Um, that there's a real point in, uh, you know, really digesting a lot of the Buccaneers game. The big thing was that the quarterback got benched at halftime. Uh, three turnovers led directly to, to 22 Tampa Bay points, and then Tampa Bay kicked, you know, two field goals outside of that. So it it, it wasn't that, you know, special of a game. Gardner Minshew came in. Uh, he moved the ball down the field for, you know, three of his six possessions. But before that game happened, it was last Tuesday, uh, Marone was giving his uh, weekly, you know, beginning of the week press conference. And you know how I mentioned uh, earlier in the episode about Marone not playing his starters in the preseason? Yeah. He, he was asked about that, and he was asked uh, if he regrets it. And unprompted, he starts off with, uh, yeah, I've been criticized even with the organization for how I've trained the team. So without anybody even asking him, he straight up is like, yeah, I've been criticized by somebody inside this building about how I prepared the team this year. Uh, he didn't say who. But, I mean, I, I think most connected the dots and said Tom Coughlin because I, Coughlin just seems like the kind of micromanaging uh, executive that would criticize the head coach for how he, you know, chose to prepare the team that season. And yeah. then uh, during Coughlin's Wednesday press conference, uh, Coughlin was asked about that, and uh, he says, that's between me and Doug, uh, nobody else. It, if he didn't say that, wouldn't he just come out right and say, no, that wasn't me? <laughs> Dude, it's and – and we talked about the Coughlin press conference a little bit. And I I wasn't there. I don't live in Jacksonville, but it I watched bizarre. it. I mean, I, I'll say that to somebody that was there. It was bizarre. I watched it. He literally said nothing. Like, he, like, <laughs> went, went up there and, like, he said words. Like, he didn't just, like, go up there and, like, stare at the mic for five minutes. But five more games. The, things, the things that he said meant, like, literally nothing. Yeah, yeah. Like, I, you know, for uh, context, for those of you who didn't watch the uh, Coughlin press conference, uh, he prepared an opening statement, which uh, went about five to six minutes. And in it, he pointed out the negatives with the team, such as the penalties, their four and seven record. And this was before Sunday, mind you. So this was before Foles even got benched. So I'm sure yeah. his press conference post Foles uh, benching would have been would have had some takes, but um, he, and the positives about the team, he mentioned a young nucleus. He mentioned the draft class. He ran off a couple punter stats for whatever reason. People didn't really seem to dig those. And Saying then he, nothing. Yeah, and and then he took questions, and he took questions, but he didn't exactly give direct answers to a lot of them, like you had said. The the one thing that he was really harping on was we have three home games left. We still have a chance to have a winning season. This was when they were four and seven, so technically they could have gone nine and seven. And we need our fans to come out for the final three games. I felt like it was he was told to really go out and give a rallying cry for the fans to show up. Uh, and it, it's actually funny. So Coughlin implored the fans. He was practically begging them, show up to these last three games. And you know what? Fans made themselves vocal at that game on Sunday. And they probably yeah. made themselves vocal about the complete opposite thing Coughlin wanted. So, you know, he asked fans to be heard, and they made themselves heard. And he did. He got the opposite outcome of what he really wanted. And I, I, like, like you said, it, it was a lot of nothing. I mean, did, did you think there was really any point in him even coming up to address the media at this point? Or do you think he would have been better off just, like, staying in the background where he had been the entire rest of the season? Well, I think for – at least, you know, for context, I think it would have been appropriate for him to come up at some point in the season, you know, whether that be like when the season ends or, you know, maybe like a week 16, week 17, I probably wouldn't have done it when he did do it. It just seemed like a lot of, you know, trying to get people in the seats and trying to get, you know, sell some tickets as a, as a little bit of a publicity deal. And, you know, like I said, he said a whole lot of nothing. Like, yeah. you know, 
Oh. And, and for context on the depth of the answers that Coughlin gave, uh, I, I asked uh, one of the questions at the press conference. I asked him, uh, is there any long-term interest in keeping Unique and Gokwe? And uh, before I could even finish my question, he goes, we have five games left. Everybody has a lot to prove. I, I, don't, I don't even know what where is, to start with you that. You know, one. like, God, <laughs> it's so frustrating. Like, like yeah, I, we all know how many games are left. But to say everyone has a lot to prove when you haven't said anything about his contract status at any point, he now only has four games left under his rookie contract. And I'd say of all the people on the roster, he is the least to prove other than maybe Calais Campbell, you know? And yeah. I, I, and, and, and then he was asked again about Unique's contract status, and he said that's not a discussion for, for now or for the setting. And my question is, if you never talk to the media, when is the appropriate setting? When can we ask you those questions? Because uh, for the last, you know, what is it, uh, 12 to 13 weeks and even longer, fans have been wondering, is Unique and Gawkway going to be on this team after this year? And uh, to, to the public's knowledge, they have no idea. They really don't. The, the, one of the people that can decide that, he would not address the questions on Sunday. And uh, not on Sunday, I mean last Wednesday. And like you had said, he did that with most of the questions. I mean, he was asked about the Jalen Ramsey trade. He, he gave out a prepared statement the day after the Jalen Ramsey trade. Since then, he hasn't said anything. I mean, Shaq Khan also gave out a statement. But since then, the organization hasn't really talked about Jalen Ramsey. Coughlin was asked about the whole Jalen Ramsey situation because – he had not yet made himself available. You know, I mean, this was all the way back in October. So uh, almost two whole months goes by and he is just now making himself available. So of course, somebody is going to ask about, you know, Hey, why did your relationship with the best player on the team go so south that you guys had to deal? With? And I mean, you, did, did you hear that part of his answer tree? Did you hear what he said? Yeah, I heard. Well, I didn't, I, I heard, you know, about it because, yeah, yeah. you know, you know, I was looking, I was looking on Twitter. I was, I was reading some things. Yeah. Yeah. He, and, he, he, he goes, uh, I'm not going to talk about Jalen. Jalen is no longer a part of our team. You know, you know what, what Jalen, Jalen Ramsey it, what, inside that organization. I know you're a WWE guy. It seems like Jalen Ramsey is like Chris Benoit in 2007. Like they're just like, not going to talk about him whatsoever. They're just like, we're done yeah. with him. He's not a part of the. He's yeah. not a part of the team. You know, yeah. and and going back to the the whole Yannick and Gawkway thing, is like, we got five games left. There's everybody still has a lot to prove, you know. And Yannick and Gawkway is a player that is on your team that is one of the best yep. players was, on your defense. I was gonna say you're not gonna answer questions about players that aren't on your team, but you won't answer them about players that are on your team. And and he's also like. And and if he wants him there, like you know, you're not even gonna say like Yannick and Gawkway is a big part of our defense. Like yep. we'd love, we want to keep him around. Like yep. we're gonna do all we can to keep him. Like to just completely ignore the questions. Like it's disrespectful to Yannick and Gawkway. It's disrespectful to the media, and it's disrespectful to the fans. Isn't it? Like why even come out there and you know prepare this statement and don't even really have a statement to be said? Yeah. No. And and. I had really, you know, it was it was a softball question. He could have easily said, you know, uh, we want Unique and Gawkway to be a Jaguar for the long term. If they don't sign him, then, you know, whatever. But at least you had said, you know, gave that vote of confidence that you want him to remain in town. But he didn't even give that. Um, the only players he really talked about extensively, he talked about Leonard Fournette a bit uh, growing off the field, and he commended him for the job he's done. Uh, he didn't really talk about Gardner. He said, like I said, he said he had played well until the London game. And he, he uh, honestly, like the questions he addressed the most were about the bad run defense and the what his message would be to the fans. And I don't think anybody cares what Tom Coughlin has to say about the run defense. You know, we hear, we hear from Doug Marone and, and Todd Walsh about that every week. And they are actually, you know, coaching these guys that are doing it. When, when people want to hear from Tom Coughlin, they want to hear about the players that they acquired to be a part of that run defense. And he just he, – he, he didn't really answer them. So I, I felt like it was a fruitless, uh, you know, exercise. Uh, I, I got the impression that he did not want to be there. I mean, at one point uh, we were told uh, three questions left, and he immediately goes, that's probably two too many. And I, I was just like, man, this, this dude, he is not enjoying this. And I don't blame him. This season has been – frustrating and like he had even said 
he said he said to the media, he said, I know you guys want to win. It's no fun covering a losing football team. And I'll be honest with you, the most fun covering this team was when they were winning games in the first half of the season. So, I mean, he, he, he is, he's right in that regard. But at, at the end of the day, I didn't really feel like it accomplished much. Uh, I feel like if that was their way to try to pick up the fan spirits, it did the exact opposite. <laughs> I, yeah. mean, I mean, I mean yeah. uh, did, did it feel like that to you? Yeah, it felt that way to me. And, and I just kind of want to ask you kind of a quick question. Because to me, it seems like Coughlin's been in the game for a while. You should be able to recognize talent. And why do you think Gardner Minshew isn't – Tom Coughlin isn't a Gardner Minshew guy? Like, why do you think – is it – do you think it's purely based off the money that they're paying Nick Foles, or do you think there's other stuff to it? I don't think that Coughlin isn't a non-Minshew guy because when he was asked about Minshew, he said, we have two very good quarterbacks. We're very fortunate. I think that he thinks Minshew is a good player, but I think – that he, he, uh, he, for instance, when people talk about Super Bowl MVPs as a reason to keep playing a guy, they talk about two people normally. No, three people: Nick Foles, Joe Flacco, and who? G- g- guess a third. That, that Eli Manning. Yep, exactly, Eli Manning. And who coached Eli Manning in those two Super Bowls? Tom Coughlin. Yep, there you go. So I, I feel like Coughlin has a connection to. Okay, he's a veteran. He's been there before. He's won yeah, Super Bowl MVP. That makes sense. Yeah, he 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 can get through this as a veteran. So I feel like that's a part of it, just because of his track record. But I also feel like the biggest part is, hey, I'm the executive that just signed this guy to this deal. I look terrible if a rookie's out playing him. I think that's the biggest thing because uh, a wise man once said to me, uh, Eric Stoner, you know, one of my best uh, buddies I met on football Twitter. Shout out to Eric. He he has uh, said. Uh, you know, every NFL draft move is just a decision maker trying to build job security. And I look at it the same as not just draft, but off season, in season. They're trying to preserve their job security. And for Coughlin, the thing that preserves his job security is uh, Gardner Minshew staying on the bench. And that is no longer the case. As, as we all know, uh, Minshew will start next week against the Chargers. Uh, I personally have no idea how they're going to do but uh for the first time in a few weeks I'm interested to see the offense again uh the the offense have been pretty boring to watch over these last few weeks so I mean we'll see I mean next time I'm going to be in the stadium is on Wednesday uh we'll talk to Gardner probably going to talk to Foles I'm, I'm assuming they'll make him available and we'll talk to others in the locker room how they feel about the change but it feels like it's full speed ahead uh you know with Minshew and as we both said, I don't. I don't think either of us disagree with that decision. No, and and this is going to be interesting because I think if if Minshew beats the Chargers, from 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 uh, an intellectual standpoint, the Jaguars always struggle against the Chargers. Always, I feel like I've 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 been a Jags fan for probably about since '07. And they've probably played them like six, seven times in that span, and they've beat them once in that span, and usually they get blown out. So if Minshew beats the Chargers, you know, uh, Jags Twitter is going to go crazy. So I'm really interested for that. Yeah, no, for sure. I, can you just imagine the reactions of Gus Bradley defense came into town and beat Nick Foles? I, I, I think Jags <laughs> oh, Twitter would have went up I in the flames. I didn't even think too. of that. Yeah, Dude, it, it, it would have went up in the flames. Well, I totally forgot Leftwich was the uh, OC for Tampa yeah, when yeah. he came in, and I was like, oh, God, I totally yep. forgot about that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It, a, lot of, a, lot of former, a lot of former Jags uh, coming to town in the 25th season. All right, well, um, I, I think we touched on uh, really a lot of the Marone, Coughlin, Minshew Foles stuff. Uh, we're going to do one final topic, and then we can go ahead and move on to the questions. This has been a little bit of a longer episode. Um, can, Pick five Jaguars that you would want to build around for the future that are on the current roster. And, like, like regardless of contract status, basically give me who you think are the five most important players on the team. Uh, I'll, I'll give you my five. I'll, I'll, I'd go with Unique Ngakwe, Josh Allen, Jawan Taylor, DJ Chark, and Gardner Minshew. That's, that's pretty similar to what I'd say. I'd say mm-hmm. Yann- Yannick Ngakwe, Josh Allen – DJ Chark, Gardner Minshew, and, you know, 
even though I'm a former lineman, I'll, I'll, I'll leave out a lineman just to be a little different. I'll say Leonard Fournette just yeah. because, you know, you need, you need to build around a run game. Yeah. So keep Fournette for, around. For sure. I, I, I think any of, you know, Fournette, Ronnie Harrison, uh, A.J. Boye, I think, I think any of those, you know, would be solid answers. But, I mean well, – I mean, A.J. Week... can, bro. Did you see his grade? Yeah, yeah. A terrific PFF grade for all those, you know – saying how bad the offensive line was yesterday. And don't get me wrong, the offensive line was bad yesterday, but it was mostly the offensive tackles. And yeah. I, I, I know I'm saying that after I just said, I think Jawan Taylor is one of five players I would build around. But uh, Jawan Taylor has faced a murderer's row of pass rushers this season. I think for the most part, outside of yesterday's game and uh, some plays against the New Orleans Saints and Cam Jordan, who's a defensive player of the year candidate, I think Jawan Taylor has been a terrific rookie. I really do. I, I, I think that dude's going to be good. I, I, I really have a good feeling about his development moving forward, even more so than uh, Cam Robinson on the left side. Yeah, I, I'd agree. I uh, I don't know. I really like – I'm a big Cam Robinson guy, so yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, 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 I might defend Cam Robinson on that one, but they're both really talented, and I think they're both, you know, good cornerstones. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I, 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 I think Cam has a lot of talent. Cam, I think – I think it's not a hot take to say Cam's one of the best run blocking left tackles in the entire NFL. And at times Cam's a pretty good pass blocking left tackle. There's just sometimes it seems like he's either going to have a really good game pass blocking where you don't notice him, or he's just going to have a terrible game where he's beat repeatedly. And yesterday was one of those games, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I feel that. Yeah. But uh, overall though, I'm, I'm a cam guy too, but, um, I mean, we both, we both mentioned, uh, DJ Chark and, uh, and Gakwe and Allen. Uh, I think Chark's an obvious one when you have a potential top five to top 10 receiver talent on the outside who can, you know, run a four, three at six, three, six, four, however tall he is. That's a pretty nice asset to have. And I, I think he works really well with Minshew. And, uh, I mean, when it comes to Ngakwe and Allen, the, the team went the better part of, you know, about a decade and a half without having a good pass rusher. Now they have two. And I, I, I can't imagine why they would want to break that up. But I, I think if they can get Ngakwe locked up long term, it's potentially one of the best, if not the best, pass rushing duos in the NFL. Yeah, I'm so – I'm so hyped for Josh Allen. Like when he got his yeah. ninth sack uh, against Tampa, I yep. was I was really happy for him. I was I, I was over the moon for him. I I, I think that uh, yeah yeah you know yeah. and and I wonder I wonder you know what what Josh Allen thinks about you know Yannick and Gawkway. Like I I wonder like you know what what I wonder what their relationships like and like what mm -hmm. he's thinking and what he you know because he clearly he wants the end to be there but you know I wonder you know like if there's gonna be you know some some backlash from Josh Allen if they don't sign Yan yeah like, for sure know, and like Calais too because you know Calais and Yan are both good friends off the off the field yeah as for well, sure so. I mean I, I I can say just from being in the locker room that uh, Josh and Yan are really close and Josh has credited both Calais and Yannick uh you know, with his development this season. And uh, Josh, you know, he's said that, you know, Jan is one of the best pass rushers in the NFL. He's somebody I'm trying to learn from. So I, I, I get the sense that Josh Allen would very much so prefer that they keep Ngakwe. Uh, I get the sense that, you know, Ngakwe enjoys playing across Malin a lot because, I mean, I, I think they've both benefited each other. I, I think Ngakwe has helped Allen out actually get a couple sacks because, you know, like the Colts game a few weeks ago, Ngakwe gets the early pressure off the edge and forced Brissett to step right up into Allen. I mean, I, I, I just think they complement each other so well. And like you had said, I, I would imagine that Allen, you know, would want Ngakwe to stick around. Uh, in terms of backlash, as we've seen with uh, the, the locker room's reactions to Jalen Ramsey being traded, uh, the team doesn't really care how they feel on that front. You know, I mean, they're, they're going to do what they feel is right. But um, and then uh, obviously we both uh, we both mentioned Gardner Minshew, and I, I want to preface it with I'm not sold Minshew's a future franchise quarterback or anything like that, but I think he has shown enough to at least give him a chance to build around him at least for 2020. Is that around your line of thinking? Yeah, I would literally take a bullet for Gardner Minshew. Like, I mean, <laughs> I, I I I I love Gardner Minshew, dude. Like. 
being being from the Washington State area, covering you know that the, that Cougs team, he made that like he led WSU to its best regular season in program history. He dominated. He was so fun to watch, and you know the Jags drafted him, and now he's fun to watch there. Like I really think this guy has potential, and I think he could be a franchise quarterback, and I think he could be it. And I think if Gardner Minshew ever asked me to take a bullet for him, I would be in the newspapers and you'd have to read my obituary. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I think a good portion of the fan base uh, feels more or less the same as you yeah. do. I mean, he, he, he's, he is a beloved player, dude. He, he really is. It's, it's, it's kind of uncanny how, you know, he's already built such a following in the fan base. But, eh, when you play good football and you're an exciting player to watch, that happens. Okay, so uh, we're, we're going to go ahead. He's a likable and, dude, too. Yeah, no, no, I, I've I've really enjoyed all my conversations with Gardner. And that, that's not to say I haven't enjoyed my conversations with the uh, polls. Like I said, you know, one of my first days in the stadium, I went up and introduced myself uh, to Nick to say, hey, I'm John Shipley, Jaguar Maven. I'm going to be here this year. And he, he was just a really nice dude. He was really welcoming. So I, I, I think they got two stand-up dudes in that quarterback room. Uh, Three, if you count Josh Dobbs, because he's another guy that I really enjoy talking to. So, they they, they at least have uh, you know some some uh, good character guys in that room. But um, ne- next we're gonna move on to our uh, Twitter questions, and uh, first question comes from an elite Twitter name, uh, Henny Boo Boo, and uh, his <laughs> his username is Blaking Bad, and it's Blake Bortles photoshopped on. Uh, the dude's face on the dude's body from Breaking Bad. So I, I appreciate the originality. He said, oh, would you rather have the Foles Minju conundrum or have drafted Dwayne Haskins and all the uncertainty surrounding that pick? I think you go with Minshew. And I, I, I mean, I, the fact that they were able to get Josh Allen and then get Minshew, uh, they didn't know then that it was going to work out. But I, I, I think that was the best situation. And to have this Foles Minshew uh, debacle, I think worked out better long term than if they had taken Dwayne Haskins. And I said that as somebody who loved Dwayne Haskins coming out of Ohio State. Yeah, same here. I love Dwayne Haskins coming out of Ohio State, but I also love Garner Minshew even more. So I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna keep Minshew. I'm yeah, Minshew for sure. My for sure. All right, next question from uh, Danger Legs. He said, aside from data, firsthand observations, knowledge of the game, and intuition. <laughs> How could anyone possibly have known that Minshew would perform better than Foles? Uh, I mean – I knew I, it. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I think once you saw – I was willing to give Foles in the Colts game because it was his first game back, but I think once you saw the Titans game that it was obvious Minshew's just a better fit for this offense. But, I mean, they, they had to have seen some of this stuff in practice, you know? I mean, I, I just don't believe it if they didn't. Well, that's and – and, and I brought that up, like, last pod – cast too like there had to have been something during like the practice during the off season that you know had to you know shown a little bit that Minshew might have been built a little bit more for this offense yeah for sure for sure all right uh next question uh from IK Triad he said who is your ideal head coach and GM duo for the Jaguars in 2020 what do you think they'll hire if Shad cleans house uh, I, I think they'll go back to, you know, regular GM uh, running the personnel side, the head coach under him formula that they had uh, before uh, Cochran stepped in, like they had with Caldwell and Gus Bradley. Uh, for me, I think the top GM candidate would be the uh, vice president, player personnel, uh, slash assistant general manager of the Minnesota Vikings, uh, George Padden. Uh, I, I, he, he's been there for about, I think it's his 13th, 13th year. And he, he's done a really good job uh, there. Uh, people say a lot of good things about him. And I love how the Vikings have built their team. So he, he'd probably be number one on my list. And then you talk about coach. I'd say, I'll throw out three names, and I'll probably get hate for at least one of them. Uh, Josh McDaniels. Uh, I'm going to go out on a limb on this one. Jay Gruden. And then uh, Matt Rule with Baylor. I think Matt Rule is a complete long shot, but if you had to ask me, like ideal coach, candidate, he's one of them. But I think McDaniels and Jay Gruden are two good offensive-minded guys that uh, they could realistically bring in. Um, I don't – I don't know enough on the GM side of things to really have like an ideal GM, but as far as head coaches go, 
Uh, Josh McDaniels, I've always wanted the Jags to get Josh McDaniels for like the longest time. So I'd say he's up there. Uh, one of the other guys that's really high on my list is Mike McCarthy. I think, you know, he's a good offensive mind. I think that he'd bring a lot to the Jaguars passing game. And, you know, I think I wouldn't say Minshew's like Aaron Rodgers, but, you know, he has like that, you know, big play ability. And I think, you know, given – given him a coach like Mike McCarthy. And then my third option is just keep Doug Marone. Keep Doug Marone in the building. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my, my, my one point to the minshew Rogers comparison is uh, Minshew's pretty close with his family. So I think I would uh, maybe choose that one. <laughs> but, no, I, 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 I'm with you. I think they play, honestly, a similar way. To me, I said on Twitter, Minshew reminds me of a lesser version of Tony Romo just with his style of play. You know, I'm not saying he's going to have a terrific career like Romo had. But the way he extends plays without being like a burner, he reminds yeah. me of Tony Romo. Yeah, I, I, that's a good comparison. Yeah, for sure. All right, next one, uh, Jags apologist. Uh, that, that must be a very hard existence to go through, but we're going to go ahead and take your answer anyways. He said, if you're the Jaguars GM and based off 13 weeks of play, what positions are you targeting on day one of the draft? Uh, I would go with defensive tackle and – either offensive line or wide receiver. I know it's a stacked wide receiver class, but they, they need a number two across from Sharks so badly. But I, I think a run-stopping defensive tackle has to be up there. Uh, D tackle and wide receiver number two for me as well. Also, shouts out to Jags Apologist. He's another uh, Idaho Jags fan, so hold oh, yeah. it down. There we go. Holding there we down. go. We're all over the place, baby. All right, uh, n- next question. Uh, JB Miller 26 uh, has Rykel Armstead done enough for the Jags not to look to the draft for another change of pace running back? I mean, I, I don't feel like he's been given enough of an opportunity to, you know, say that. I mean, they, they just outside the Denver game, he really hasn't played that much. So, I mean, it's hard to really answer that just because we haven't seen that much of him. Uh, I think he's a talented player, but I think with Leonard Fournette, I'm not sure if a change of pace back exists with Leonard Fournette exactly. on your team, you know? I, I would agree with that 100%. That's exactly what I was going to say. Like, Raquel Armstead is Raquel Armstead. You know, Leonard Fournette is going to be the bell cow of the offense. He's going to be in there every snap, damn near. And uh, that's just the way she goes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, ne- next question. It is from – it is from – let me see. I like Papaya's. Well, <laughs> well, definitely coming at us with the interesting usernames here. But they asked, let me pull it up. What's the likelihood of important front office figures such as Coughlin and Marone getting fired before the end of the season? I don't think – I think if anybody was going to get fired before the end of the season, it would have already happened. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, so I, I, I think they're going to let them play out their final four games. Uh, Shad Khan has fired somebody during the season before when he fired Gus Bradley with three weeks up to play in uh, 2016, but I don't think that's happening here. I, th- I think he's going to let them finish out the season on uh, both ends. Yeah, yeah I'd agree. I, yeah, think, sure. I, I think Todd Wash is a wrap, like, as soon as the – like. As soon as week yeah. 17's over. Yeah, no, if, 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 that's another one. If they were going to fire Todd Wash, they would have done it two weeks ago. They would have done it a week ago. You know, he he's just not getting fired during the season. And if he is, I will print out the uh, screen cap of my uh, Twitter my Twitter list, and I'll, I'll eat it on Zoom and upload a video. I'll eat the tweet because I just don't think Todd Wash is getting fired during the season. I, I definitely think he's getting fired after the season, but – I think if you did, they were going to fire anybody during the season, they would have fired Todd Walsh, and it would have happened weeks ago. So, I, I personally don't think anybody's getting fired, uh, at least during the season. After the season, I expect Coughlin and Marone to definitely be gone. Uh, Dave Caldwell, I think he might survive, dude. <laughs> I, really I do, do, too. <laughs> I really do, too. I think he might, dude. I'd... Yeah. I, 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 if, if you told me to guess right now, I'd say Marone and Coughlin are fired. Caldwell stays. But, um, okay, well, that, that's uh, the, the rest of our questions. we got a few others, but they were about head coach candidates too. So I, I just say refer back to that my answer on that one. I say Josh McDaniels, Jay Gruden, or Matt Rule with uh, George Patton from the Minnesota Vikings. And, uh, Tree, before we go, you have any uh, parting hot takes for the people? Um, let me think. You, you, do you got one? You got one brewing? So I got, I'm trying to think of one. I mean, they, they've kind of 
just with all the moves the last week or so and all the, you know, giant news in terms of Coughlin speaking and now the quarterback being benched, they've kind of killed off any hot takes. I feel, yeah. like, I feel like every hot take is, you know, coming to life. I'll, uh, uh, I, I guess my hot take would be that uh, they missed Ronnie Harrison more yesterday and they missed Jalen Ramsey. Yeah, okay. That's a good one. Um, Blake Bortles would have been more competitive in that game than Nick Foles did. Oh, man, I'm – I'm sick that I can't disagree with that. I I I can't. And anybody that knows me, you know, I'm I'm not a Bortles guy whatsoever, and that's that's putting it lightly. And I I just don't disagree. Like you said, he at least was mobile. And yeah, I mean, Foles is a better thrower of the football, sure, but you're not getting different results. So I don't care how many spirals you can throw in practice if the results on Sunday aren't. I mean, if they aren't different, then what does it really matter? You know. And on the lowest key, I didn't think this was going to happen, but it's been kind of not, – not, not the Jags specifically, but, like, him leaving his, his coaching job. Look for Mike Leach to maybe be somewhere, maybe in the NFL. Maybe. Yeah? Dude, my, my, maybe. Mike Leach in the NFL would be glorious. <laughs> dude, would, that would be too much, I think. I, think I, would, I would love it, dude. My, Mike Leach, Gardner Minshew, Unite in Jacksonville. That would be a fun team to cover. I'm, I'm – I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and rubber stamp that idea. If it actually I, happens, everybody can refer to Jaguar Maven Podcast for help uh, making it happen. Uh, Tree, yeah. you got anything else you want to say to the folks before we head out for tonight? Uh, no, uh, just thank you guys so much, too, for all the support on Twitter as well. Uh, I was in the hospital for a while because your boy had seizures, but we are learning more and more each day about what's going on with that, and I appreciate it all the love and all of the support. And we're going to be back on the YouTube grind starting soon. Uh, probably starting probably with this, uploading this on Tuesday or Wednesday. So thank you guys so much for tuning in as always. And thank you, John, for having me on as always. I yeah, for sure. It. And Treve, I just want to say, you know, while we're recording, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad that you're getting back in the swing, swing of things, man. Uh, you've been in my thoughts. Um, been thinking of you, uh, you know, for everybody that doesn't follow Treve at Treve Talks on Twitter, Stand up as a guy, as you're going to see on Twitter. And, you know, I've only known him a few short months, but I, I, I'm, I'm glad to call him a friend. And I'm glad to, I'm glad to have him on uh, the Jaguar Maven podcast with me. Uh, that, that, that's all we have, y'all. Uh, thank you again for listening to the Jaguar Maven podcast, and we will see you next time.